ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our first speaker this evening is Andrew Katz. Uh, Andrew is a lawyer with significant experience in open source licensing for both hardware and software. So please give a warm welcome to Andrew. And he's going to be a free and open source licensing for his file. Thank you. Right, fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, in an alternative universe, um, I may have been a chip designer uh, because um, I had an offer to go and study chip design at Edinburgh. Um, but I decided to go to Cambridge and study law instead. I don't know who got off better there, but uh, <laughs> things could have been very different. Um, I've got um, two things that I wanted to talk about today. Now I realise, um, how much time have we actually got to half an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom fairly rapidly through because I've got I've got sort of two separate related presentations. Um, one of them is about a survey that I did for Western Digital um, last year, and uh, that gives a sort of state of play of where we are in open core licensing in general um, and where we could potentially go, and then that leads into a uh, certain open hardware license, which is something that um, I've been involved in drafting as well. Um, I do have a ex very lengthy presentation on that, but I'm not going to be able to go through it, so I'm just going to sort of zoom through that fairly rapidly. Um, I'm very happy for this to be interactive, um, as long as that doesn't cause any problems with live streaming. I don't see why it should. Right, it's a room microphone. Yeah, okay. Um, so if anyone wants to um, interrupt me and ask any questions or um, suggest that I go into anything in any greater depth, or indeed this bit's boring, please speed over to the next bit. Very happy to do that um, as well. Um, so kicking off uh, with the results of the survey. So um, this, so it's actually um, two years ago uh, when I started this process and I was going, um, going for, sort of throughout 2018 and we've, we've sort of updated to 2019. Um, but Western Digital, um, you know, obviously sort of pioneers um, in the world of RISC-V processing. They asked me to do a survey on what the licensing outlook was because they were interested in figuring out what was the most appropriate um, license for uh, licensing their own efforts. Um, so the way that we did this was we, we uh, identified the major open hardware communities, um, we did research of those organisations, uh, did some um, telephone interviews with prominent um, individuals, um, Jeremy being one of them, thank you very much for that, um, and we reviewed projects on open Corb and Libra cores, which are you know, sort of two, two of the, the um, major repositories of information here. So how did we define open source? <laughs> well, we looked at those um, projects where the licensing term complied with the definition set out um, in the Open Source Hardware Association. Um, and uh, we looked at specific licenses which they identified. Uh, so the uh, copyleft reciprocal licenses, um, there were some projects that were licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, uh, share -like licenses, um, some licenses, some of them were licensed under GPL, um, and um, then um, also uh, there are some hardware specific um, licenses, um, such as the Tapper Open Hardware Licensing Server, uh, going on there, but we ignore that. Um, and then um, the permissive licenses that you'd expect, uh, BSD, MIT, um, and it was also the solder pad hardware license, um, which is a version of the Apache license, um, which I sort of hacked around to make it a little bit more open hardware friendly. Um, so uh, we did some desktop analysis, um, and uh, first of all, uh, Open Source Hardware Association has already done a few surveys. Um, it's quite interesting is that 50% of the respondents had released projects with no explicit license at all and it's sort of assumed that if they let the project out there, people would assume that it was some form of open source, um, there was no explicit license. Now, it's worthwhile bearing in mind that these were projects covering the whole spectrum of open hardware, so we're not talking about processor cores here, we're talking about everything from you know, open source Coca-Cola, um, open source mechanical devices, you know, um, and through to electronics, which is probably the, the <coughs> largest um, area of, uh, of, of open hardware. Um, and in these surveys, it was found that there was rough equality between permissive licenses and um, copyleft licenses. Um, in some cases, uh, we um, did um, a sort of GitHub search uh, to see uh, how many projects were licensed under specific licenses. Um, so uh, when we did the original um, uh, search, um, so the, the, the string that we used was um, siteco on github.com CERN OHL, uh, which actually sort of produced some um, semi-meaningful results. 
Um, so uh, back in March 2018, we found 16,657 results would come up on, on GitHub. And looking through those, approximately 80% of those results were, were projects. So you get a sort of fair feel for the number of projects that were on GitHub that were licensed um, under the CERN open hardware license. Um, uh, similar <coughs> um, mechanism, if we look at the Tapper open hardware license, only 15 um, appear to be legitimate projects out of 39 results. Um, and um, solder pad, um, that eight is, is it, I don't know actually what's happened with the numbering there. Um, I think that's 434, of which I will, I will fix this slide. Um, it came up in the search, um, of which um, 18 appeared to be a leg legitimate project. Uh, somebody else did a survey, was um, Open Piton. Um, and uh, this is much more skewed towards uh, processor cores. Um, and in this survey, they found that recent projects more heavily weighted towards permissive licensing rather than copyleft licensing. So um, in this case, um, you'll see the blue represents copyleft, red represents permissive. So far more permissive license projects um, here than uh, copyleft. Um, and um, so what's interesting is if you look at the non-active projects, um, many more of the non active So these are projects that sort of started off and then have petered out for one reason or another. Um, it, that tends to be the projects that have copyleft licensing um, as opposed to permissive. So, the, you know, active projects are very much skewed towards permissive. Uh, projects that have petered out are skewed very much towards copyleft. Um, looking at um, open cores and Libra cores, um, so uh, both of those websites host core designs and um, other materials like tools and interfaces and so on uh, that you can put um, in your uh, projects. Um, Libra cores tends to have fewer projects, but they do tend to be more active than the ones in open cores. Um, so open cores had uh, 30 verified entries out of 1,190 total entries at Libra cores. Um, has 90 entries, um, which we can assume are active ones. Right, so we did some interviews, and uh, these are some of the comments that came out of the um, interviews. I'll go, there's a list of the individuals that we, we interviewed um, later. Um, so one of the questions was about their preference for copyleft versus permissive. And these, these are basically all individuals who are sort of heavily involved in, in the world of um, open core licensing. Um, so um, everyone, apart from one interviewee, noticed uh, noted that a permissive model was more likely to be uh, effective from a commercial point of view. Um, and it was universally acknowledged that the problem with copyleft licenses was that they didn't provide sufficient certainty regarding the boundaries. And this is the problem is obviously existing copyleft licenses are not intended for core designs. You know, they're either intended for software or they're intended for content. So it was a lack of certainty that was the main reason for not adopting some form of copyleft license. Could, could you uh, say a little bit more why, what's the difference between the copyleft and permissive? Yeah, sure. Um, so a copyleft license is one that means that if you take a component um, under copyleft and you incorporate it um, into another design, then the whole of the design uh, would have to be released under the same license. Um, so there is that sort of fairly um, constraint in there, and yeah, there is a remain free. Um, a permissive license is one where you don't have um, a similar constraint. You can mix com com permissive license components uh, with components under other licenses, proprietary licenses, even copyleft licenses. And permissive license doesn't have that form of constraint. To, so it's much easier to use permissive licenses. You have to think much less hard about the licensing situation as far as permissive licensing is concerned. Um, so there was one interviewee who noted that um, um, Open Spark uh, was actually fairly commercially successful. That was licensed under GPL version two, uh, but only one, one person mentioned that. So copyleft is not necessarily uh, a kiss of death as far as commercial designs are concerned. But the issue with copyleft um, was this lack of certainty, as I mentioned. This is really in terms of where does the boundary of the copyleft stop? Um, and there are two issues. Uh, there's a vertical um, problem and there's a horizontal, horizontal problem. Um, so uh, the vertical problem um, really is in terms of, you know, if you take a copyleft design and you incorporate it um, into something and then that's incorporated, um, you know, onto a chip and you put the uh, chip um, onto a circuit board and the circuit board goes into a case and the 
case that goes into a data center, you know, at what point does that copy left effect stop? Does it mean that ultimately you would have to you know, release the design for the whole, whole data center? Um, and horizontal is where you're talking about designs at the same level. So if you have one copy left design that's on a chip die and <coughs> a whole load, load of other components on there, like memory controllers, interfaces, whatever, does it mean all of those other interfaces um, have also to be released under the same license, or is there some sort of delineation that means that they don't have to? And because the existing copyleft licenses um, have not been designed with hardware in mind, um, other than the certain open hardware license, um, which we'll come on to in a second, and Tampere Open Hardware does have some copyleft stuff in there, but they're not really designed with um, open uh, um, core licensing in mind. Um, the, the, the common licenses like GPL Creative Commons really don't know how to address this particular problem. Um, so um, what I, I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the CERN Open Hardware License version 2, how that actually works. Um, but what drives license choice? Well, you know, as we've seen, people are expressing a preference for permissive licensing uh, because of the uncertainty. Um, and it's, it was also generally accepted by the interviewees that the license choice is, is to a degree ideological. So there are these um, two, two sides of the coin, really. So people sometimes uh, look at these in terms of um, you know, open source versus free software, um, uh, open source initiative versus free software foundation. But um, and also licenses like Apache versus, versus GPL. So, um, you know, on the freedom, GPL, free software side of things, that organization really is geared around maximizing freedom. And what that means is that it is very anti the idea of something that was free becoming closed later. Um, the idea is that a piece of code or, um, or a project, or whatever it happens to be, once it's been released under this form of copyleft license, means that everything else that is in the same project also has to be released under the copyleft license. And it's not therefore capable of being incorporated into something proprietary. And that the idea is to maximize freedom, to create a pool of free designs. Uh, on the, the flip side, maximizing use, which is where you're talking about very easy to use licenses like MIT, BSD, um, Apache, and so on, means that you don't have those constraints. So as many, many people as possible can use projects under those licenses, even if they're um, going to incorporate them into proprietary projects, and that's fine. And this is where there's a sort of a tension here. So quite often the license choice is driven by, are you a, a use maximizing person? Um, or are you um, somebody that wants to maximize freedom? Uh, there was also some comments about what Richard Stallman calls selling exceptions to the GPL. Um, and this is a business model which is instituted by some organizations where they take a piece of software, in this particular case, release it under um, a fairly restrictive license like GPL with the idea that they know it's going to be palatable to some organizations. Um, in the hope that those organizations are going to come back to them and say, you know, we can't live with this under the GPL. Um, you know, if we pay you some money, can we have it under a license that suits us better? Um, so this is, this is um, basically a, you know, a, way, a way to make money, but also to claim that uh, you're open. Um, I'm not going to say that anyone in the world of open hardware has actually done that, uh, but it was um, perceived that there was a potential issue and that is something that, that, that could happen. Sometimes that business model is something that drives license choice in the direction of GPL in particular. Um, some of the interviewees also talked about open hardware um, communities and uh, there was a perception that the lack of open source local or low cost tool chains was a real in inhibitor um, in the growth of open hardware communities focusing on cores. I think the situation is getting better, um, but it's still you know, nothing like as good as the situation is as far as software is concerned, where you can have a complete free software tool chain um, in virtually all languages. And in fact, you know, quite, quite often um, the tool chain, uh, the, the open source tool chain is now the default for those, those languages and those build methods. Now, what was quite interesting is that, so cores which um, emulate obsolete or obsolescent designs are much more likely to be licensed under copyleft licenses. And I suspect the reason for that is because people who are more interested in um, the sort of hobbyist side of it, you know, who, who, who want to be able to recreate 
um, you know, 6502s and, uh, and Z80s and, and so on. Um, they, they, they're more likely um, to be hobbyists. There's less likely to be a sort of commercial reason for wanting to do that. Uh, so, so as a result, um, they're keener on maintaining <laughs> freedom and they're keener on releasing these designs under uh, GPL. They're not particularly you know, they're open to the idea of these particular designs ending up in something um, commercial um, or proprietary. That's not particularly likely to happen. So they're more, they're more um, tend to be more sort of freedom loving. Um, however, um, you know, all of the commercial organizations that uh, we spoke to um, preferred uh, permissive licenses um, and uh, that certainly seems to be you know, the clear bias of the results. Um, so tool chains, I mean we've mentioned that um, open source tool chains are um, much rarer in open hardware worlds. Um, talking about patents, um, so it was generally noted patents are a problem uh, but nobody had any particularly great ideas on how to solve this. Uh, so the, the, the conversations didn't really go um, particularly far as, as, as this plan was concerned. Quite interesting, uh, this really echoes the view of a, a lot of open source software that I speak to as well. They just wish the patents would just go away. Uh, um, so um, in terms of thinking about the default license that projects should use, I mean, everyone is uh, unanimous in that it should be, um, you know, one of the more popular licenses that you use, but let's try to avoid license proliferation um, or not use weird licenses that people don't understand. Uh, but obviously the specific license chosen depends on the business needs. That sort of goes without saying, really. Um, the reason less well used licenses should be avoided is because they can cause incompatibility problems. You know, if you end up trying to um, intermingle a bunch of projects under different licenses, it does make it quite complicated to figure out whether you're actually legally allowed to do that. So um, it reduces legal costs and um, just general admin time if, if um, uh, you know, there's a smaller number of licenses to deal with it. And the more familiar licenses you know, clearly the easier it is for parties to use and understand because that understanding will have become a, a community norm. So uh, interviews believe that um, the most commercially effective licenses were permissive licenses and, um, and that, that actually is something that's borne out by this research. So that was the conclusion. Um, uh, the currently available copyleft licenses weren't clear enough um, and the potential benefits of copyleft uh, weren't sufficiently clear to show a need to, to shift to a, to a copyleft model. Uh, but everyone said, you know, if there is a decent copyleft license that comes out, then that's certainly something we may consider for future projects. Uh, this is a list of the individuals who participated, so many thanks to all of them. Um, and uh, so now I'm going to sort of shift over. Sorry, that was a sort of super high speed zoom. That. Um, so, talk about um, an open hardware license that has specifically been designed to address um, some of these issues. So, I sort of started out in the world of open hardware by um, writing so quite quite a, quite a lengthy article about um, how I think that there are major problems with making copyleft work in the world of open hardware in the first place. I think it's a complete waste of time. Uh, at which point, uh, then I was asked by CERN to help get involved in the drafted latest version of the CERN Open Hardware License, which is a copyleft license. Uh, so my sort of extreme skepticism <laughs> has been, been somewhat tempered, and we put a, put a lot of work in actually trying to make this license work and. Um, the question is, have we done that? Well, first of all, it's now a suite of licenses. Um, it was originally one license, uh, but we looked at the model of the Creative Commons and saw that there's sort of different flavors of licenses for different purposes. Um, so we've done that as far as the version two of some open hardware licenses uh, concerned as well. I'll talk about that a bit in a second. So um, brief history, um, it, the whole thing kicked off in March 2011, um, it's been through a number of versions. Uh, version 2 has been the longest in gestation because we've had 
far more involvement with various people and organizations um, than we have in any of the previous versions. And I think as a result, you know, it, the version two is a much better license. So the first um, beta um, of the of version two came out in 2017. Um, we're now up to our first release candidate, um, and all of this is sort of available publicly. The URL is on here a bit later, and, and um, so we're hoping that this is the version that people are happy with, and we'll be able to, to formally release fairly shortly. So, what are we trying to achieve here? Well, we're trying to achieve copyleft for hardware, at least with two of the variants. There's the copyleft variant. It's also a permissive variant, which I'm not going to talk about very much. It's designed to cover a very broad range of hardware, all the way from mechanical devices to electronic devices and also as far as silicon. And this has been part of the, the problem or part of the challenge that we've had to face is the fact that you know, hardware is a very, very broad thing. I mean, even in terms of thinking about you know, beer, can you have open, uh, open source beer? Well, the answer is yes, you can. And, you know, that's, that's a fluid. So, you know, it doesn't even have to be something that's solid. It can be liquid, it can be gaseous, um, and um, it even works for, for software as well, this new license. So we tried to cover a sort of whole spectrum of different things that would conceivably be described as, as hardware. And uh, in common with any copyleft license, the idea is to create a commons of hardware designs that can be easily intermingled with each other. And we also wanted to try to make it easy to understand, and that, that really has been the, the biggest challenge of all. So the specific challenges that we um, encountered here, first of all, as I touched on earlier, it's the scope of the copyleft. Where are the boundaries? You know, if you incorporate a certain OHL license component in your design, how much of the rest of the design also would have to be released under that license to be compliant? Uh, we wanted it to be compatible with other licenses as much as possible, so that if there's other components in there uh, that are licensed under things like um, GPL version 3, um, for example, um, is it possible to, to actually make them um, compatible with each other um, so that it is possible to, to combine those particular designs? Um, we've tried to address the problem uh, that I mentioned, that there are fewer mature free and open source um, tool chains um, in the world of hardware, um, so particularly as far as ASICs and to a degree FPGAs as well. Um, and we had to put some exceptions in to allow some proprietary components, a little bit like the Linux system library exception, um, because you, know, you will inevitably in the real world, you have to have some, some proprietary primitives that go in, in there. So they, they need to be covered as well. Um, and we've also had extensive conversations with um, you know, individuals and organizations like the Fossey Foundation to find out how this can actually work with um, uh, things like FPGAs and ASICs. Um, We've also sort of had to address, address some other issues as well. There was originally some gendered language in there. We've tried to simplify the terminology. Um, we've stolen a whole load of terminology from other licenses that people may be familiar with, like Convey, that comes from GPL version 3. Um, and um, it's contracts now, not a bare license. Haven't really got time to go into that sort of less legal nicety, but um, that's, that's the way that it's, it's constructed from a legal perspective. And there are now three variants. Uh, there's a strong variant, which is sort of like the GPL, there's a weak variant, which is sort of like LGPL, and then a permissive variant, which are sort of like Apache. Um, and you can make it work for software as well, interestingly enough. So what's the scope? So how far does this copyleft effect work? So I'm only talking about the copyleft variants at the moment. So this is a summary of, of what the license does. Now, where, uh, where there are capital capitalized terms here, these are terms that are defined in the license, but this is not a, this is a summary of the license. This is, you would not find this wording anywhere in the license itself. Uh, but the idea is um, that if you make a product using um, covered source, you must make the complete source available to a recipient of the product, either privately or via a source location and license your complete source under the CERN OHL. And then you know, I'll explain what some of those terms mean. Um, but um, that should be, to give it a general overview, that should be sort of reasonably easy to understand. So what, does, what do we mean by complete source? Well, the complete source for design includes uh, the design materials, the code, interfacing information, etc. But it doesn't include something that we call available components. And for available, and I'll, explore, I'll give you some, some illustrations of what that means later, um, but a, an available component is something that you only have to provide specifications and interface information. 
So, okay, what do we actually mean by that? Well, let's imagine that you've got um, a circuit board um, which is released under the sign of an hardware license. Now, that will contain some components. So if it contains your sort of standard components like resistors and capacitors, then they will, if they're readily, easily available and you've got the necessary specifications for them, they'll count as available components. So what that means is that you just have to say, you know, what, what they are. Um, so it's a, you know, 330 ohm um, uh, quarter watt resistor with certain tolerance, for example. So the sort of information that you would get if you go to um, you know, any of these, um, okay. Thank you. Um, so if, if you if you have, have a look at a you know, circuit design that you might um, get in, in a, a magazine or whatever, um, and it will basically be what it says in the bill of materials there. All this sort of standard stuff, resistors, capacitors, inductors, 555 timers, etc. All of all of that stuff is an available component and you don't have to provide any more information for them than is necessary for the design. Um, but it could be that the design also includes includes something like an FPGA. Um, now, I mean, the chip itself is a standard design, that itself could be an available component, uh, but it's not really a great deal of use until you load it with a bitstream. Um, and uh, the bitstream may be an available component, it may not be an available component. Um, if it isn't an available component, um, in other words, it's not something that you can sort of easily get hold of from somewhere else and you know what its specifications are, etc., um, then you will also have to um, uh, when you're um, providing the design materials for project, you'll also have to release that under the CERN OHL as well. Um, and then uh, as part of the bitstream, to create the bitstream, um, then that's likely to contain custom code, standard libraries, third party libraries, etc., which may either be available components or they may not be available components. So you can see the way this is sort of operating in sort of chunks of, of hierarchy. Um, and basically, yes, or is that a question? Yeah. So, so like a resistor, yeah. I pay money for. But yeah. it's available. Yes. There's custom code and standard libraries. I might also have to pay licenses for. Yes. We uh, acknowledge that. that uh, available. Yeah, we acknowledge that you may have to pay licenses um, for stuff that um, are, they may be available components. If they're available to you on a sort of non discriminatory basis, you know, unfortunately, you need to pay a lot of money for them. Uh, they're still potentially um, an available component. Um, we obviously sort of discourage people from putting those sort of components in, if possible, um, but that's more of a community norm that's something that we can actually police as far as the license is concerned. And, and how does time play a factor? Because something that's not an available component today in five years may well be something that you No, it, it, exactly. Uh, and again, we, we, we've thought about this and um, what we're saying is, again, as part of community norms are concerned is that um, you know, if you... Um, if you release something, then you know you have to believe that it's going to continue to be available for a period of three years after um, after you release it. But you know, again, there's not a huge amount that you can do about that. Um, so uh, the circuit board itself can be fitted inside um, an enclosure, and it'll probably have some sort of power supply connected to it to make it work. Um, and then that enclosure may well be put in a rack, and that rack will be connected using you know, working in power plane blue maybe um, and then that rack may end up in a data center um, so the radical difference between version two of the CERN open hardware license and previous versions is that it's now very hierarchical the idea is that you can look at you know each um, each of these projects can be different projects at a different level and um, it sees the projects underneath potentially as available components where you don't have to um, release the the um, the whole of the design material, and um, and if you go higher up the um, uh, um, up the hierarchy, um, then you know you will incorporating a CERN OHL component um, into something like an enclosure, um, because the circuit board itself can be regarded as a product. So that's something that is like you know a, a, an end thing. Um, then um, you, then that means that you don't have to um, provide the. Uh, the, the design for something that it may fit into. And again, you know, we encourage people to do that. Um, and there are examples of um, people, particularly um, in sort of CERN itself, as has been involved with people you know, creating measurement equipment that goes into racks and things, and they have, they have produced the designs for the hardware that circuit boards fit into and designed for the racks, et cetera, et cetera, as well. Uh, but they're basically licensed under CERN OHL at different levels. It's not just one CERN OHL that covers absolutely everything. Um, so I'm probably got about sort of five minutes or so, so I'm going to run through this um, uh, pretty rapidly. 
Um, so an available component um, is something that, well, if it's itself, uh, itself available under CERN OHL or a compatible license, uh, then that's fine. You've automatically got the information that you need um, to be able to make it if you want. Um, or um, it's available with specifications, characteristics, and interface information necessary to make the product. So, for example, um, you know, talking about uh, resistors, um, capacitors, etc. But with an, with an example like that, I mean, it may be absolutely critical that um, something has particular thermal characteristics, you know, a, 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 um, or it may be um, that it's got a, a, a certain power rating in the case of, of a resistor. Um, if that doesn't matter, you don't have to mention it. If in the context of the whole design it is important that it's a one watt resistor, then you would have to mention that. Um, if it's important that it's you know, made out of particular materials or that it's, that it's um, a particular physical size, again, you would have to mention that as well. So the specifications, the characteristics, and interface information provided are those information pieces of information that are necessary for the specific design that we're talking about. But um, you know, generally speaking, if you get a data sheet for one of these pieces um, of uh, one of these components, it will contain all the information that you need anyway. Um, and then finally, to deal with the um, realities of dealing with A6 and FPGAs. Um, if it's part of the normal distribution of the tool chain, then it also counts um, as an available component. So this will be some sort of things like primitives um, that uh, you'll be using to make your design. They may well be proprietary. You know, there's not a lot we can do about that, unfortunately. If we didn't have that exception in there, then it would just make it extremely difficult for anyone to make FPGAs and basics um, using the most commonly available um, uh, tool chains that are out there. Um, and, uh, I mean, product, as I mentioned before, may be a finished product, um, but it may also itself be a component, um, but it may be an intermediate form, um, which in itself is sort of like a complete thing. So um, it could be a, a bit stream, or it could be a, like a sort of .o object file, and I can just sort of zoom over this fairly, fairly rapidly. So basically, the way that we deal with this is we constrain <coughs> copy left upwards by the product. So as soon as you've got a product like the circuit board, then that means you can incorporate that circuit board into um, your case design, as I mentioned before. That I mean, it doesn't mean that the case design automatically has to be released under the CERN open hardware license. And then this downwards constraint um, is uh, comes out of the definition of available. Sorry, are you, are you talking about weak or strong version? No, you guys are talking about. Uh, yeah, so that, that, this, is, this is for both of them. It covers, covers both of them. Um, now, the difference between strong and weak is quite subtle, um, and I haven't really got time to explain it in depth, but basically this is mainly aimed at ASICs and FPGAs, um, and ASICs and FPGAs, and fundamentally, um, if you've got a chip design and you're using the strong variant, then if any component is a strong variant component, then the whole of that chip design would be, have to be released under the CERN Open Hardware License. Um, whereas if you are using the weak variant, so if you use a component that's licensed under the weak variant, uh, then uh, that would mean that the um, other um, components on the chip don't necessarily uh, have to be released under uh, the CERN Open Hardware License. So think of it in terms, it's like LGPL, it's like a, it's like a library. If you've got um, a, a library that is um, released under the weak version of the CERN OHL, so a library of particular components that you might want to fit onto your, your die or um, as, as part of your sort of functional bitstream, then um, you can freely um, release those and intermingle them with proprietary variants. As long as you actually provide all the code that you need for that particular component itself, um, you don't have to provide the code for the whole of everything that goes inside the ASIC or the FPGA, whereas that's not the case for the strong version. Um, so I say it's a bit more subtle than that, but that gives you a sort of flavour. So if you're if you're used to software licensing, uh, think in terms of the distinction between GPL and LGPL. Um, the missing version is simple. Um, it's obviously a lot simple, simpler um, than the copy left versions. Um, it's pretty similar to Apache um, in that it's a notice file in there that uh, contains details about attribution, etc. Then that has to be preserved um, on transfer of the source. 
um, and um, you are able to um, like actually relicense under a different license as long as you keep the notice file intact. Um, but um, it's broadly similar to the way the SolderPad slash Apache license works, um, and um, they they are sort of intercompatible between the two. Um, why not allow GPL relicensing? Uh, the answer is it got far too complicated. And uh, what if you have got a design and you want to incorporate a GPL component in it, you are by far the best solution is to speak to the people who develop the GPL component and say to them, uh, please, can you also dual license this and then possibly use it under CERN OHL as well? Um, because uh, the trouble is, as soon as you allow um, a copyleft license to be re-project and you re license under, a, um, under another license, then you sort of get a race to the bottom in terms of whichever one has, has got the, the least amount of copyleft um, uh, 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 attached to it. Um, so the reality is that um, you know, trying to make them intercompatible just really wasn't going to work very well. Um, so there, these are some reasons why we didn't didn't allow that. Um, but it is actually a lot more straightforward if, if you can uh, persuade people to change the licensing to a dual license of CERN OHL and GPL. Um, right, I'm not going to go into that in, in detail, but this is just uh, all, all, all of these slides will be um, available afterwards. Uh, so where are we going next? Right. Details are all available at this um, URL, so you've got all of the drafts, etc., um, to look at there. Um, so we've been talking to people like Fossey Foundation, SPDX, etc. We've got some really good feedback, actually. Um, so more in-depth feedback on this version from uh, I think I think it's the silicon community has been really really helpful uh, because we focused this on potential use in silicon. Uh, we have had some sort of great great people coming out with excellent suggestions. So we've done some pretty radical changes to the license as a result of that. Um, if you want to comment on the licenses, um, having had a look at the drafts or indeed just sort of general questions about them, uh, that's my email address. Feel free to get in touch. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I thought that was a sort of incredibly <laughs> rapid zoom through. <laughs> yes, just right at the back there. Um, question uh, regarding your survey in the previous. Do you get a different response? Between the bigger company and the small company startup on the license use? Um, I think the yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the small the, the, the smaller companies that are starting up, um, they they tend to think they want to sort of play with the big boys anyway. And um, so they realize that to get into the world of you know commercial licensing, they're gonna have to go permissive. Um, I mean the larger companies I can't think of any exceptions at the moment. I think they're all permissive, but somebody may be able to come up with another one. Um, so I don't think there's any real distinction between sort of smaller companies and large companies, but I, you know, I would have to check the data, but at the top of my head, I don't think there is. My feeling is um, the copy lab might be a bit more favored for the small one because it's potential for the investment because what it did is have to be yeah. kept it there. Um, I mean, yeah, that's what then they deal with the older patent. Yeah. The... I mean, the, the, I suppose the question is the extent to which they're free to choose a license. Um, because if smaller companies, um, you know, if they've if they've started within, for example, a university and they become a university spin out, it might have been that the university project found a copyleft license to be more attractive. Um, and therefore, as a result, unless they could actually get a re-license from all of the contributors, they would have to stick with a copyleft license when it went out into the real world. Sorry, did I just call the universities not the real world? Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, so I think. Yeah. This is a fantastic piece of work. There's been loads of questions since 2010 about why why can't we apply software licenses to open hardware. Yeah. And you know, even if you go and look at the strong provisions in the GPL, when you start to move away from C, yes. does it get sticky? No, absolutely, absolutely. How long you've had to do all of these things. Yeah. One thing I want I like you the wonder if you could talk a little bit about is if you go and look on the free FSF.org website, it says when, yes. you, when should you choose GPL and when should you choose GPL? Yeah. One of the things they say is that you should be motivated by kind of eco ethical and economic concerns. Yes. So yes. like 
if if you're just doing this innovation in this area and there's no proprietary competitors, then you should use GPL. Yeah. Because if you're competing with existing incumbents or market share, you should use LGPL. How in your weak and strong um, differences, how have you considered that kind of mechanism, or was it motivated in a completely different way? Um, we're sort of neutral about this. Um, when I say sort of neutral, I mean CERN is, is very much keen on the strong variant and they want people to try and use strong whenever possible um, in, in the same way that Free Software Foundation would rather people use GPL rather than LGPL or permitted licensing. But you know, in both cases, both organizations do accept that there's a, there's a place um, for uh, the, the lesser, and and even in, you know even the case of the Free Software Foundation would admit that, that sometimes you know it, it's easier just to to, to use a, a much more permitted license. So we didn't really want to get too much into that. Um, but I think I think part of the problem is that because you know there are so many proprietary tool chains, um, it really became necessary to acknowledge that and to say you know we we would just make it impossible for people to use a, a completely restrictive um, copyleft license unless we acknowledge that. So uh, that, that was sort of down. So we're trying to be pragmatic about it. Um, but I think the idea of having three different variants and allowing people to choose the variant is going to be interesting to see how, how that pans out. So is, is the strong one strong enough? If you release something as strong, then it kind of infects outwards, even though you can still use proprietary underpinnings in that? Uh, yes, yes, basically. So really, that's the way of avoiding the kind of, I guess, intellectual property capture that the software people are worried about these days with Amazon, yeah, et cetera. Yes, that's the yeah. intention is that can avoid that problem. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. And I, unrelated, are there any instances you know of where companies have been taken to court as a result of violating a hardware-related copyleft license? Um, I haven't come up, no. I mean, there's, there are a few enough in the world of software, yeah. but I haven't come up across any of them. Yes, thank you. So uh, for the tool chain, if you write something um, that can work with a certain API interface that mimics, say, um, NVIDIA or AMD SDKs, mm -hmm. okay. how would licensing work in this scenario? And also, uh, more broadly, uh, if you're restrained from applying for patents, but for proprietary, players could, uh, it's first to fire for the patents. Yeah, well, on the patent front, it has got quite a lot of patent language in there, and it, it sort of takes various patent um, ideas from Apache and also from GPL as well. Uh, so basically anyone who um, is um, distributing some sort of OHL um, licensed material and they have um, contributed to it in a way that would infringe their patent, then they're providing a patent license covering those particular contributions. So from that point of view, it works a bit like a bit like Apache. Um, and then there's also some patent retaliation clauses in there. Um, so it's 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 sort of closest to an, to an Apache style model um, than anything else. Um, as far as the first question is concerned, um, I mean if you're talking about incorporating components that are normally part of the tool chain that you're you're using, then they wouldn't be covered. Um, if you're talking about when you sort of an API, you're talking about an interface. Yeah. Um, so if you, um, yeah. So this this is this is doesn't where, where where it does get fairly complicated, and you have to look at the specific use case. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, you can always design something in a way that the boundary stops at the stops at the API. Um, basically, once you've defined what an API is and somebody is interfacing with it using that specifically defined boundary, then if you're using the L version, um, so the lesser version, uh, then that doesn't <coughs> cause um, the copyleft effect to sort of cross the boundary, basically. One final question? <laughs> Any final question? No, we've exhausted that at the moment. Right, fantastic. Can, okay. I, can I just do, do um, a little, uh, hang on. Okay. Let's yeah, sure. Um, okay, I haven't got the slide to the next bit, unfortunately. Ah. Um, so um, the uh, DG Connect have, um, you may be aware of the fact that uh, they um, last year put out a call for tenders for a project that's very important uh, for the European Commission, which is looking at the economic um, benefits and analysis of both open source software and quite interestingly open hardware as well. 
Um, and this is in, intended to be a piece of work that uh, comes up with a report that's going to be the basis of European Union policy making um, in the future. So um, anyway, that has been won by the, the by Open Forum Europe um, and um, the um, Fraunhofer Institute. Um, so um, I'm one of the people that's involved in that. I know that Jeremy has been asked to participate as well. Um, we're very keen to hear from people who want to provide us with information, influence us, get involved, et cetera, et cetera, um, in any way. So this is something that you'd be interested in, in getting involved with. Um, if you could give me an email um, and um, then I will take things from there. But I think it, it could you know, potentially be extremely important as, as far as European Union policy is concerned for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So it's an exciting piece of work to be involved in. So thank you very much for that. Perfect.